children of the earth and sky, we are nurtured, sustained, given warmth and light from above and below, supported by earth's strong, firm crust, we build our homes, till the fields, plant our gardens and orchards. When we turn from self and seek to be aware, we will find holy light in human faces, in blossom, birdsong, and sky. Then earth is truly our home, and we are one with all of earth's creatures, parents of earth's children, yet to be. This time we have an opportunity to light our candles of community. You can light a candle for a joy or a concern or simply to bring more light into our space. Let us stand together in body or spirit for our chalice lighting and for our spoken affirmation. In honor of earth-centered traditions that celebrate this time of year, we observe that the flaming chalice holds the elements of the four directions, earth, air, fire, water. The lamp oil for earth, the air that feeds the flame, the fire we light, and the chalice itself, the cup, the symbol of water, we light our chalice and reflect on the balance we seek in our lives, the balance we seek in our hearts, the balance we seek in our world. Let us join together in the spoken affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom, and to help one another. May be seated. I do have to note that I, I, I am aware that you trust yourselves with real flame back here, there, and I don't get a real flame <laughs> up, up here. <laughs> the words of the chalice lighting this morning remind me that that was not a, a real flame. <laughs> but it is the real flame of our hearts. Our opening thought this morning comes from Catherine Hayhoe and her book, Saving Us. She lives just down the road in Plano, Texas. She writes, True hope 
must begin by recognizing the risk and understanding what's at stake. Rational hope accepts that success is not inevitable or even entirely probable. It takes courage to do that. But when we are doubtful, when the odds are low and success is possible rather than probable, it's that courage and hope that carry us forward. Real hope also provides a vision of the future that we want to live in, where energy is abundant and available to all, where the economy is stable, where we have the resources we need, where our lives are not worse, but better than they are today. First reading comes from the book, Our Fragile Moment, by Michael Mann. Michael Mann is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and previously he was a professor at Penn State University in uh, climate science. Michael writes, but the conditions that allowed humans to live on this earth are incredibly fragile. And there is a relatively narrow envelope of climate variability within which human civilization remains viable. Today, our massive societal infrastructure supports more than 8 billion people, an order of magnitude beyond the natural carrying capacity of our planet, the resource limit of what our planet can provide in the absence of human technology. The resilience of this infrastructure depends on conditions remaining the same as those that prevailed during its development. Let us be in an attitude of meditation as we listen to the words of Gary Kowalski, All Our Relations. Let us breathe in. and out. In and out. Our time is short here on the earth. Around us swirl immensities of time and space a universe infinite in all directions. How small our hopes and cares seem amid the panorama of creation.
Yet we are not separate from the cosmos, but have evolved and grown out of it, like the leaves of a tree or the waves upon a sea. And our thoughts are its thoughts, our lives a manifestation of never-ending vitality, our spirits a microcosm of the beauty and creativity of the whole. Fill us then with reverence and compassion for all who are our kin, cloud and sun, sibling and cousin, the multitude of beings who share this improbable and never to be repeated moment. All expressions like ourselves, of the mind at large, the spirit at play, the, dy the dynamism at work, in whom we live and move, and whom we will never fully know. Our second reading also comes from Michael Mann's Our Fragile Moment. He writes, despite the breathless claims of climate-driven mass extinction that one sees all too often in today's headlines, we are not yet remotely committed to such a future. We can't avoid catastrophic climate impacts if we take meaningful actions to address the climate crisis. Yes, that's an important if, but the science actually tells us it's doable. Yeah. 
to the 1980s <laughs> and the some of the reflections I'm making this morning also bring me back to the 1980s because I'm reflecting on a book by Michael Mann that he just wrote this past couple of years just published a few months ago called Our Fragile Moments. Michael Mann is a climate scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also a high school graduate in the class of 1984, which is also my graduating year. So I love reading Michael Mann's work because he uses examples from pop culture that I relate with <laughs> because he's, he's my age, including uh, he, he really loves the, uh, the music of the police uh, from the 1980s as well and in, in the recent book. He uh, used some uh, songs from the police to, to make some points, including the, the point that we don't want to uh, walk in the footsteps of the dinosaurs. If you 
uh, recall a, a song from Synchronicity in 1983, Walking in Your Footsteps, was a song by the police uh, reminding us that if we don't, didn't move away from the precipice of nuclear war at that time, which was a real concern then and unfortunately a real concern now, that we might walk in the footsteps of the dinosaurs. I'm also leading a discussion group on Michael Mann's book, Our Fragile Moment. We have two more sessions left. You're definitely welcome to join us uh, for those sessions this coming Friday and then the Friday after the next Friday because we will not be discussing this book on the day after Thanksgiving. In his book, Our Fragile Moment, Michael Mann notes that when we look at the Goldilocks conditions of our planetary home that seem to be just right for the existence of human beings and for the flourishing of human civilization, he notes that we might be tempted to think that the earth and everything therein were created this way to be just right, just for us. But such a human-centered view of our terrestrial home ignores the fact that for the vast majority of Earth's 4.5 billion years of existence, it has not been hospitable for creatures just like us, Homo sapiens. It took a lot of cosmic luck and a lot of evolution for Homo sapiens to make it to our current Goldilocks moment here on Earth. It's only in the last few hundred thousand years that climate conditions <laughs> and evolution led to the existence of human beings, and it's only in the last six to 10,000 years that climate conditions allowed for human civilizations to develop and to flourish. This is only a blip of geologic time. So it's pretty clear that the earth was not made just for us. It's estimated that life on earth formed around 3.5 billion years ago, and I'm hoping that there will be life on earth for billions of years to come. Our time on earth as a species is just a moment by comparison. But it's our moment, <laughs> and it's very much up to us how much longer this moment, this fragile moment for human civilization will last. Will the human moment be a flash in the pan moment? Or will we be able to extend our fragile moment for multiple generations into the future, hopefully thousands of years to come. Extending our fragile moment requires that we understand as much as we possibly can about what allowed for our current moment to emerge so that we do not do anything that will prematurely end the conditions favorable for our moment to flourish as a species on Earth. Fortunately, through science, and Michael Mann takes us through that whole history of science in relation to the development of life and the great extinctions of life on Earth. Fortunately, through science, we have been able to learn much about how events and conditions of the past have led us to the present. And this can be helpful as we work to extend our moment for our species here on our planet. By studying the Earth's past, we have come to know what conditions are good for the flourishing and diversity of life. And we also know what conditions have not been so good for the diversity and flourishing of life. We know that rapid changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans 
are not good for the flourishing of life. We know that acidification of the ocean is not good for marine life. We also know that the plate tectonics of the earth are sometimes more favorable and sometimes less favorable for the flourishing of diverse life forms on earth. <clears throat> when volcanic activity gets really strong, that ends up being over time, during that time less favorable. When all the continents come together in one large continent, that's less favorable. But there are other times where those same plate tectonics become more favorable for the flourishing and diversity of life on Earth. We also know that there are natural cycles. There are natural events that will, will periodically create challenges for life to adapt, evolve, and innovate. We know that living on Earth is not easy, even in relatively stable times. It's a constant struggle for survival, and the fact that we as humans have created civilizations to not only survive, but to sometimes, not always, but sometimes also thrive, is actually an amazing achievement of our species. But here's the deal. In the midst of our relative thriving as a species within our amazing human civilizations, we have recently managed to have such an impact on the planet that we are recreating in the present many of the conditions that have been so problematic for the flourishing of life in Earth's past. Conditions that we know contributed to those five previous extinction events that I've spoken with you all before. We know that that the rapidly changing chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans have diminished life in the past, yet we are continuing to acidify our oceans at a pace never seen before. We know that rapid changes in the climate have been bad for life in the past, but we are continuing to cause a rapid change in climate more rapid than humans have ever experienced in the history of our species. We know that biodiversity loss can cause a cascading effect that leads to even more biodiversity loss. But we continue activities like deforestation and the destroying of other habitats that are increasing the extinction, the extinction of species all over the earth. It's no longer a lack of knowledge. It's no longer a lack of knowledge that is recreating the conditions that have led to the previous extinction events. <clears throat> Maybe it was at first. We didn't know that when we were drilling and bringing up all of that oil and gas and coal to use for the purposes of having a more flourishing human civilization at first, we didn't know what the effects of that would be, but now we know it's no longer a lack of knowledge. We know what we are doing. What we have been lacking now is not knowledge, but the collective moral and political will to move in new directions that will protect and further the conditions for not only continued flourishing of life on earth, but also the continuing flourishing of human civilization. Though our current condition, our current situation is undeniably one of dire urgency, the good news is this. The good news is that moral and political will are renewable resources. And we are seeing significant shifts in attitudes and practices around the world to preserve a livable climate, to extend our fragile moment for at least a few more moments, and hopefully many more centuries into the future. Michael Mann, in his book, reminds us that today is not the time 
for what he calls doomism. This is not the time for doomism. This is the time for doing. And there is so much that we can do. We don't have much time to avoid some really horrific consequences, but if we do act collectively, we can make a future that will be so much better, so much better than the future will be if we do not act. And here is even more good news. So many of the actions that we need to be taking are truly better for our personal flourishing and for the flourishing of our communities. They are life-giving actions that reconnect us to one another, that reconnect us to nature. They are peacemaking actions that will create conditions that will lead to less conflict and less violence in our world. Much of the conflict and violence that we're experiencing in the world today are exacerbated by conditions that are causing us to move away from a livable climate. So these are peacemaking actions, and they are justice-making actions as well that will lead to more just and equitable distribution of wealth and resources so that more persons will experience greater opportunities for the experience of well-being. The actions we need to take are those that will help us more fully express love for one another. They will help us more fully express loving our neighbors as ourselves as we work together to live and to love into the vision of a beloved community. So what does the climate past have to teach us? about the climate present, and what can we do about our climate future? Yes, I was thinking of Scrooge when I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> scientifically, scientifically, the climate past calls us to pay attention to preserving as much as is possible the conditions that led to our fragile moment of human flourishing. Politically, the climate past calls us to tap into the renewable resource of our political will to take the collective action needed to preserve a livable climate in the present and into the future. And morally and spiritually, it calls us to love each other. It calls us to love future generations. It calls us to extend our love not only to human beings, but to extend our love to all of life and to love all of life enough to give us and life a chance to evolve more fully into this fragile moment, to evolve more fully into beloved community. So in response to climate past, I have one simple admonition, one simple phrase of encouragement. Let us love one another. At this time is our time of giving, and there's opportunities to give at the table and also to give online.
Kilimanjaro 350 For the children who will follow 350 For the seasons ever turning For the ancient forest burning Seize the number, speed the warning 350 Step it up, we can't slow down Now take my hand and don't let go Gotta make it to higher ground now Glaciers melting, oceans warming, 350. Cities flooding, insects swarming, 350. We took the earth and its sweet wonder, paved it over, plowed it under, sold it short and still we hunger, 350. Step it up, we can't slow down, now take my hand and don't let go. Gotta make it to high in the ground now. And shine. People dying in the heat now. Three, five, oh. People marching in the street for three, five, oh. Blood red sky, storm tide rising. Can you see that blue horizon in your eyes? On the prize, it's three, five, oh. Adelante sin descanso. Step it up, we can slow down now. Take my hand and don't let go. Gotta make it to higher ground now. Three, five, oh. Three, five, oh. Three, five, oh. My friend Bill McKibben was one of the founders of 350.org. And by the way, right now it's 419 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Let's stand for our parting thoughts and the extinguishing of the chalice. Our parting thought comes from Kathy Huff. Our time in this place may have ended, but our connection to each other and this community remains. Together we may walk the path of justice, speak words of love, live the selfless deed, trod gently upon the earth, and fill the world with compassion. Let us join together in the words to extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.